Good evening. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to our recently dedicated Sister Augusta Maria Auditorium, which, as many of you will know, has been named after the first of our female principals here at Leeds Trinity University, uh, the principal of, of Trinity College. More importantly, uh, it's my pleasure to be welcoming you to this evening's Trinity Talk, given this evening uh, by the Right Honourable, the Baroness Varsi. Just to say a few words in terms of our, our 50th anniversary, for those of you who may be first onto campus and, and new visitors, the university was founded as two Catholic teacher training colleges with an intake of 300 students back in October 1966, Trinity College for Women, All Saints College for Men. And these were created to, to train the next generation of, of teachers. Since then, we've expanded significantly. We now have more than 3,500 students, we offer 88 degree courses, and we pioneer professional work placements which are offered to every one of our undergraduate uh, students within both their first and second year. So in our 50th anniversary year, we not only want to celebrate the past 50 years, but we also want to take time, reflect, and to start our celebrations for the next 50 years. And these high profile Trinity Talks are part of that to help guide us and to inspire us in terms of where we need to go. And again, I'm absolutely delighted this evening to welcome Baroness Sadira Varsi. Baroness Varsi is a lawyer, a businesswoman, a campaigner, and a cabinet minister. Baroness Varsi has had many roles. Yeah but she's best known for being the first Muslim to serve in a British cabinet and the youngest peer in the House of Lords, aged 36. Baroness Varsi was born in Dewsbury and studied law at the University of Leeds before entering politics in 2004. In 2010, she was appointed by the Prime Minister, David Cameron, as Minister Without Portfolio, becoming the first Muslim to serve as a cabinet minister and the iconic images of her standing on the steps of Downing Street in her traditional Asian outfit were beamed across the world. She was soon made Senior Minister of State at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and Minister for Faith and Communities. A fierce political campaigner, Baroness Varsi resigned from government in 2014, citing the government's morally indefensible policy on Gaza. She is now Chair of the Baroness Varsi Foundation, focusing on three programme areas of social mobility, gender equality and freedom of religious belief and is a trustee of the Zavira Foundation, which works in Pakistan to empower widows, divorcees, and orphan girls through their skills, education, and other poverty relief programs. Earlier this year, Baroness Varsi released her debut book, The Enemy Within, which is also the title of her Trinity talk this evening. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you and to invite Baroness Varsi to give her talk. Thank you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and it is a, a real pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a bit of a rumor going around, actually. Um, yesterday, uh, I, was at the, uh, I was at St. Mary's in Twickenham, and we were celebrating 60 years of uh, Cardinal uh, Murphy O'Connor's um, service uh, to the Catholic Church. Uh, today, I am here. Uh, I have had the privilege of meeting both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Uh, and the rumor that has been going around now for many years is that I am a closet Catholic. Uh, so, so in many ways, possibly calling this book The Enemy Within was quite apt. Uh, and, and one of the things uh, that I will be talking about today is how over time different communities have been seen as the other. Uh, I hope that uh, you will bear with me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I give you a little bit of a potted history about uh, who I am, uh, where I come from, uh, what makes me tick, uh, and then a little bit about what I wrote about in the book. I've been asked to speak for 40 minutes and take questions for 20. I'm going to speak for 20 minutes and take questions for 40, which I think will be a much more enjoyable experience. Um, so I was born in 1971, the second of five girls, born into, born into a traditional working-class Pakistani family in uh, Dewsbury in West Yorkshire. Mum um, always said things got better when I was born because Dad had been a mill worker 
um, and a bus conductor. But when I was born, he became a bus driver. So things started to look up for us. Um, we, uh, we were quite unusual as a family in the sense that uh, uh, coming from an all-female family meant that from a very early age, uh, we certainly felt that there was something different. I always felt that we were special. Uh, I think in later life, I realized that many other people thought that we were inferior. And I'm absolutely convinced that there are five of us because mum and dad kept trying for that elusive boy. Uh, but they ended up with the five of us, and that's what they had. Um, but I think that changed the course of our lives. Because, uh, as I say, and I've said often, sadly, in certain conservative communities, and certainly the conservative Pakistani community that I grew up in, uh, although many of my uh, English friends remind me it wasn't that dissimilar in English communities not so long ago, when a girl is born traditionally 40-odd years ago, uh, it wasn't seen as a great celebratory movement because boys were seen as assets girls were seen as liabilities, boys were seen as contributors, girls were seen as takers, boys carried honor, girls carried shame. And therefore, you know, we were born, as I say, right from the outset on the wrong side of the balance sheet. And we spent the rest of our lives arguing for equal worth and equal value. But what we had were parents, a father who absolutely believed that he was capable of doing anything, and as were his children. It probably came from that migrant work ethic of arriving here with nothing and building up uh, an incredibly successful uh, set of businesses eventually. And mom, um, although again came from what I would call was a working class family, she thought in middle class. And therefore, from a very early age, she made it clear that we needed to raise our game and improve our life. And the way she thought that would happen was through an education. And so whereas many girls of my generation were being encouraged even to leave school at the age of 14 or 15, and we're talking now in the 70s and 80s, my parents were pushing us to go on to college and university. And like most uh, Asian mothers uh, of uh, my era, I would say we, when I was growing up, Asian mothers chose both your career and your husband. Uh, and uh, so we were sat down at, uh, in my teenage years, and I remember my mum lining us up and saying, you know, teacher, lawyer, accountant, doctor, pharmacist. I mean, it literally was. We were handed a career. Um, and that's what we did. And we felt so privileged to be, to be of this small, very small handful of women within the Asian community at that time who were allowed to go on uh, to university. I, I got law, which was uh, not a bad thing. Um, I went on to study law at the University of Leeds. Uh, I specialized in criminal defense, initially working for the CPS and then going into private practice. And you could say that having been brought up in a very strong working class home, things got good. Uh, life in my 20s was good. Um, I spent a lot of time volunteering around the issue of race. Uh, I always say that when I was growing up, what radicalized me was the color of my skin. My religion was almost quite irrelevant. It, it wasn't a part of my identity. And then things started to change. And um, I always say that... Um, uh, September the 11th, but even before September the 11th, things started to change. But September the 11th, for me, absolutely changed the course of my life. Uh, it was probably a combination of that, a combination of the fact that the man that my mum had chosen for me uh, wasn't really the man that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And my marriage had started to fall apart, and I had a very early midlife crisis. And at that point, I sold my legal practice, and I went to the only other place that I thought I could possibly try and live a life, and that was to Pakistan, a country that I was neither born in nor raised in nor knew much about. But somehow I felt that uh, I could potentially make a life there. So I picked up my little girl, went out to, to Pakistan, and spent a year learning about a country uh, that I had only really heard about in stories from my parents. And having spent... Uh, a few months out there early on, I realized that had I been uh, a woman divorcing with a young girl in Pakistan, there was really nowhere for me to turn. Uh, and I, I went back to the village areas where my parents had originated from, and I realized that if you were a divorcee or a woman or a widow or an orphan girl, you really were the most marginalized in society. Uh, and uh, I always say that if you see something and you think it's not there and it's needed, you create it. 
and I therefore set up the Severa Foundation, which uh, Margaret mentioned. Uh, it's now been going since 2002. We've had over 35,000 women go through the program who are now financially independent. We work just with widows and divorcees and orphan girls, the most marginalized in society. But having spent nearly a year out there uh, finding myself and having my midlife crisis, I realized that I needed to go back home and that I'd taken the easy option by running away. And if I really wanted to create a sense of ease between my country and my faith, and I wanted to play my part, then I needed to be back in Britain to do that. Now, there are some in my party, at the new conservative end of my party, who think that this gap year in Pakistan is a little bit suspicious uh, and cannot be explained. <laughs> I assure you, in case we have a prevent coordinator in here, that I, I, it was not my jihadi gap year. Um, and, uh, and yes, I did. I put on record, I visited Abbottabad, where they finally found Osama bin Laden, but we did not meet. Um, and, uh, but I think it taught me a lot about the way the world was changing. And uh, I came back, and I was um, being terribly opinionated at a Tory party conference. Uh, when I was um, uh, asked, uh, I was pulled aside and asked by Oliver Letwin whether I would consider standing. And I did, I thought about it and I decided to stand for a seat. Uh, I decided that I wanted to stand in my hometown in Dewsbury. Um, that election in 2005 uh, taught me a lot about how so much still needed to be done in relation to understanding between communities. 2005 was the election where the BMP scored the largest number of votes anywhere in the country in, uh, in Dewsbury. Uh, it was the election where I remember canvassing in what I would call staunch conservative areas um, and being told that conservatives couldn't bring themselves to vote for, I hope you're not offended, a vote for a PACI. Um, I was told in very conservative Muslim communities who had voted for a English woman for many, many years uh, that they didn't think it was, this, it was right for Muslim women to be taking up leadership positions. And I still recall the day when uh, on the night of election, I, I mean, I, in my kind of usual enthusiastic way, managed to convince large parts of the national media that, cons that Dewsbury was going to be a conservative gain on the night. Uh, the upshot of it is I got lots of media. The downside of it was I was humiliated in front of the national media. So I set myself up to fail. And I remember walking out after the results came in on that night. And... Um, as I walked out of the town hall, I was met by um, about 200, mainly, sadly, uh, men from the communities I'd, I was born and raised in, from, uh, uh, from uh, Dewsbury's uh, Asian communities, um, who booed me out of the town hall uh, uh, for having had the audacity to stand. And I remember my father putting his arm around me. And it's that horrible moment, isn't it, when, when your dad puts his arm around you and then you think, I'm going to cry. I was, fine <laughs> until you, I was fine until you did that. And I remember a microphone being shoved under my nose and um, a journalist said, you know, how do you feel? And I thought, oh, okay, well, it's four in the morning. I've been working for weeks. I haven't seen my daughter for months. I've just lost an election. I've got 200 people booing at me. Work it out. Um, <laughs> and I remember thinking, I'm going to cry. And this will be the only thing I will ever be remembered for, my Gaza moment on TV when I lost Dewsbury. And I, I didn't cry. And uh, I got through that interview. Um, and a few weeks later, I had a call from Michael Howard, and he said, look, you know, there's interesting times in the party. I'd like you to meet a young man who I think you'd work, enjoy working with, and that young man was um, somebody called David Cameron. And as they say, the rest is history. We ended up working together on his selection campaign, his election campaign. Uh, in 2007, he asked me to join the Shadow Cabinet. I wasn't a member of the House of Commons, so I joined the House of Lords uh, at the age of uh, 36. Uh, the House of Lords is a is an amazingly privileged place to be, but a fascinating place. It's a bit like House of Cards meets Downton Abbey. Um, <laughs> and now, having been there for 10 years, um, I'm 46 now, uh, where the average age is still 69, uh, there are a handful of us born after 1969. We call ourselves Generation X, where the babies <laughs> of the house. I think there are very few places where you can be 46 and in a job for 10 years and still be a newbie. Um, <laughs> And uh, I had, I had, you know, I would, did I ever think that the girl from Dewsbury would end up serving at the cabinet table? And I had the most fantastic time serving as chairman of the Conservative Party and then in the Foreign Office. But for me, who I am and what I stand for always came above politics. And those things came to a head for me when I was minister for 
the, of uh, uh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, for the UN and for human rights in the Foreign Office uh, during 2014 when the Gaza conflict was on. And um, I just couldn't um, reconcile what it is we were doing against what it is we said we were doing. And I think there are two very simple questions for politicians. Uh, which seem like quite innocent questions, but actually would make politicians raise their game. And they're this, you know, do we say what we believe and do we do what we say? And so often we don't. And I felt that at that moment we weren't. And however great it would have been to stay, because it was probably the most wonderful job that somebody like me would have been doing, I felt that long after politics had come and gone, I needed to be able to live with myself. And therefore, I resigned. And um, I remember my dad ringing me on the day and saying, well, we've just stood down your office, you better get back to work. And uh, I came back to work, I'm back now in the family business, involved in a whole series of things around academic and pro-vice chancellor at uh, a university, a visiting professor at St. Mary's, I do some work with uh, Georgetown. But, you know, there's, um, I call it the insecure overachiever. If you come from the kind of background that I come from, I don't know if it's a female thing, an ethnic thing, or a working class thing, you always go through life with somebody thinking somebody's going to walk into this room and tap me on the shoulder and say, what are you doing here? And you're going to have to justify what you're doing here. So I thought, you know, it's, it's great having all these honorary degrees and being called a visiting professor and kind of work, feeling like you're working in the academic world. But what will convince people that I'm really clever is if I write a book. Um, <laughs> so, so I started to write this book. Um, it took me nine months. It was like a pregnancy. I put on a stone, um, and uh, and it was painful. Uh, and I shouted at my husband a lot as to why uh, I was doing this. Um, and but at the end of it, you know, like most pregnancies, something hopefully beautiful is produced, and you forget about the awful stuff, and you just remember the good stuff. Uh, I'm not quite at that moment to say I'd go through it all over again. Um, but I felt that this book needed to be written for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because I think there are many people of my children's generation who look at us and think, how did you screw up so badly? How did you get here? And I felt like we needed to pick unpick that journey to find out you know, who are the Muslims, how did they get here, what do we think of them, how did we get into this mess, and how do we come out the other end? Uh, the second reason why I felt um, it was important to write this was because obviously it would make me look clever. Um, third, and thirdly, because when I was growing up, the insult that was usually directed at people like me um, was, was the term Paki. And in the 80s, people of my generation started wearing this T-shirt which said Pack One on it. We kind of took back the phrase in, in some ways in which certain bits of the... the the black community have taken back the N-word. It's a kind of a, a saying, well, I'll take back that insult. And when I was in government, uh, not soon after Drummer Lee Rigby um, was killed and murdered, um, I used to sit on the National Security Council and we set up the Extremism Task Force. And a right-wing commentator wrote, you know, how can we deal with the war on terror when we have Baroness Farsi, the enemy, at the table? And I felt that as someone um, whose grandfathers had both served in the British Indian Army, uh, whose father and parents had worked their backs and the, broken their backs in the mills and created a job, you know, a life for themselves and jobs for others. As somebody who had served her country at the top table and as somebody whose children are now once more about to serve in the armed forces in the, of this country. 60 years on, I thought this man was saying to me, you don't belong and we don't trust you. And uh, so I thought the best way of dealing with an insult is to field it well. And this book is my way of fielding that insult by unpicking it and proving that it is nonsense. Thank you. Right, uh, we have 40 minutes, so plenty of time for uh, a lot of questions to be asked. If you indicate that you'd like to ask a question, just Hold it until the microphone arrives so everyone can actually hear what's being said. Yes, sir. I don't need a microphone. <laughs> what I would say, what's really surprised me tonight is, A, I can't believe you bought a city. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'd also say that... <laughs> so you got competition, mate. My husband's at the front, by the way. Makes no difference. What I would say is that you've proved you're very British by having an excellent sense of humour. But one of the things that interested me, it's your title, The Enemy Within, 
The fact that 65% of Muslim Asians voted Labour in 2015 and only 25% voted Conservative <coughs> makes me wonder whether or not the nuance could be that your own ethnic group saw you as an enemy within there. The other thing that I found very interesting is Leila Bulela saying that uh, your uh, idea was to end the divide between government and community. And considering what's happened recently, and obviously with the um, referendum to leave the EU, but looking at what's happened in America and other countries around the world, I feel that there's never been a time where governments and communities were so far apart. And I just wondered how you felt about that. Mm. Um, I agree with you. I mean, one of the things that I do in this book is I unpick the various mistakes that were made. And that includes looking at how communities started to drift apart, how government policy actually disengaged certain bits of uh, uh, communities, uh, the language that we used and what that... Uh, I mean, let me give you an example. We have um, uh, the issue of terrorism, which we, we is a real threat and we need to deal with it. Uh, if you look at, if you speak to any expert from the intelligence services to academics to people who study the lives of, of terrorists, they will tell you that there are something like 15 to about 30 different telltale signs of what makes a terrorist. And they, there's a whole series of things that we can look out for. And if you look at the lives of the recent terrorist attacks, even the Westminster attack, they display these, these uh, uh, features. Would you want to guess how many of them government focuses on when it sets government policy on terrorism? One. One. We focus on this concept of ideology. It's all ideology. Forget the fact that, you know, what may have happened before. Forget the fact that there may be issues around grievance. Forget the fact there may be issues around mental health. Forget the fact that there may be issues around previous gang culture. Forget, forget, you know, we just forget about everything. We say it's all to do with this one issue. And so one of the concerns that I have, and I kind of unpick it in this book, is to say that if we're genuinely going to create a community, a country which is at ease with all the communities that make it up, we've got to start by having honest decision making based upon evidence. Um, and the last bit of this book, there are three chapters where I have quite frank conversations with the Muslims, the politicians, and then the rest of us to say, how do we make this better? Each one of those components has to do its bit. Uh, I think... The challenge we have in today's politics is, and I, you know, I, I was going to be, I'm, I'm really keen not to talk about party politics tonight. We're in the Perda period, we're into an election, and it's not for me to, to start preaching on about conservative party politics here. But I don't think there's any political party right now which is responding to that sense of creating a sense of ease between our nations. And, and it's not new because we've suddenly got the new bogeyman of the moment, the Muslims, who we need to start to deal with. You know, we have a problem with this potential second, second referendum in Scotland. We have Wales asking for a different kind of a relationship. We have a power sharing agreement in Northern Ireland, which has fallen apart. We have a country which is not cohesive and at ease with itself. So long before we get to the, the Muslims, we've actually got other issues to deal with as well. And I think post Brexit, we're in a slightly, we're in a, I think we're in a worse space as to how we start to deal with these relationships. So I hope that some of the stuff that I outline in the back end, the, the, you know, the last three chapters of this book is about saying, I call it press the restart button. And I talk about which, what each of those kind of components can do differently to try and start to create this sense of ease, which, which is so desperately needed. I've read, your, I've read your book this week, and it's, I would recommend it to everybody. It's very, very readable. Um, you, you are very critical of prevent, but you don't, I think, actually come out and say we should scrap it as part of the way forward. So, and I, I am the prevent coordinator in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so. What I, say, what I say about prevent, you're absolutely right. So what I say about prevent, prevent first started in 2000. Prevent for those who aren't anoraks like us is basically a quarter of the counterterrorism strategy. So contest, which is the counterterrorism strategy, has four components to it, uh, which includes uh, preparing for a terrorist attack, pursuing terrorists, um, and of one of them is this concept of preventing people going into terrorism. And that P was the, was the one that was going to deal 
not just with terrorism, but the causes of terrorism. That's what Prevent was all about. Let's deal with the causes, the root causes of terrorism. So things like grievance, discrimination, a battle of ideas, community-led, all of these were very much part of what, when Prevent was first published in 2006, was what it was all about. If you look at the various iterations of Prevent, and I do them in this book, they change. The emphasis of what it's about changes. And it stops becoming a community-led, let's do this together, battle of ideas, stop our young, a safe space. It's the kind of space where, you know, I should be able to, you should be able to take your kids if you're concerned about them and feel that they're not going to be, the rest of their lives are not going to be affected. It has over time either perceived or in reality, and there are both, you know, there's a perception about prevent and a, a real examples of where prevent has gone horribly wrong. It's seen as something that's done to the community. It's seen as a securitized space. It's seen as a kind of a, a spying space. Now, this isn't my view. You know, let's not put this down to the views of individual politicians. This is the view of parts of our police, parts of our intelligence services, the George Soros Foundation, you know, Open Society, Helena Kennedy. So really, you know, uh, uh, people from across the board, David Anderson, the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. And what all of these people are saying is it's time to review prevent. It's time to have an independent review of this policy, the basis of it, whether it's working, which bits are good, which bits are bad, more transparency, the trainers, the training. All of that, and, and government at the moment is resisting. Now, today, there's been an announcement in the manifesto that there is likely to be a commission on extremism. Whether that's being used as a kind of a cover to say, okay, let's review all of this stuff and come back to it, whether it's going to be used as something else, I'm not sure. But interestingly, the Institute for Government today were talking, were, you know, saying to me, do you think this is what it's going to be? Is this a review that we've been asking, you know, you've been asking for amongst others? Uh, so I genuinely believe that if we... You know, if if, um, if 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 large sections of the community that you're trying to influence are saying hate this, it's clearly not bro. It's clearly not working. It, the brand is broken. There's something about it that needs to be fixed. And I think that for government just say no, no, it's working, and let's just double down on it is not going to be the answer. Okay. Yes, at the back. <clears throat> will be on Christian organizations that maybe aren't in any way extreme. Um, what would you define as your term of extremism? And I know you've mentioned it in your book. I haven't read it, unfortunately, but I will get a chance to soon, hopefully. Um, how can the government ensure that groups that aren't doing anything that's extreme, in a sense, not be labeled as being extremist? OK. Uh, so the definition of extremism we have been arguing about for 15 years. And we've gone round and round a circle. You know, Michael Gove and I made a kind of a, an ongoing debate about this. He had one view of what was extreme, which was what Michael didn't believe in at that moment in time was extreme. And I, I had another view, which was let's look at our history and assess this in terms of the fact that this is a journey that most people are on. And so, you know, let's take, for example, homosexuality. You know, religious leaders who have certain views about homosexuality are extreme. Yes, well, you know, let's go back to the Thatcher Manifesto of the 80s. You know, we, we defined family values as Section 28. We now define family values in the Tory party as equal marriage. We've been on a journey. And therefore, let's not kind of say, we've arrived at Destination X. Destination X is the best place to be for everybody. And anybody who's not at Destination X is an extremist. And, and that's my concern. This has to be an enduring definition which isn't specific either to a community or a space kind of that we're inhabiting now. And when we would define, and, and interestingly, we don't really define extremism in any other sense except for Muslims. So the only definition we have in government policy at this moment is Islamist extremism. So for the moment, Christians, you're all right, right? So, it's, and when we were defining Islamist extremism, we went round and round the houses about what it meant. Um, and, you know, my friend Michael had a fantastic uh, kind of definition that he gave, which amongst other things, he said, was people who were inspired by the teachings of Said Qutb. 
Now, most of you will think, yeah, we all know who Saeed Qutb is, not the guy next door. Saeed Qutb was, Qutb was a, you know, I'm not going to go into the politics of it, but you can Google him. So I decided to go and do a poll of young people and said to them, do you know who Saeed Qutb is? And the three question, answers I got back was, is he a rapper? <laughs> is he a cricketer? Saeed who? And so here we have a government policy which defines extremism on the teachings of X, and nobody knows who X is, by the way. And again, this is the kind of issue, and then this was questioned in the House, actually by a Northern Irish member of parliament, who said, you know, we're concerned about preventing where it's going. And he said in the House, and I quote it in here, he says, he had been told by a ministerial, he had been told by a minister, oh, don't worry about it, it's not you lot we're after. <laughs> And we don't, oh, by the way, we don't apply prevent in Northern Ireland. It's a great policy, but it's not good enough for Northern Ireland. Um, and so therefore, what I kind of said, and then we had various moments where you'd have realized we went after extremism within religious institutions. And then we said, oh, no, no, but we don't mean Sunday school. And, and I remember saying to David, look, you can't make policy which is community specific. If you talk about British values, we have to say this is the value we're preserving and we're preserving that value across the board. You can't say we really don't like imams who don't like homosexuality, but if you're a priest who has certain views on homosexuality, you're all right. Because that is the first step towards saying, and then at the same time, you can't say, and you're Muslim, stop moaning about be being treated differently. Because I know he's treating you differently, but will you stop moaning about being treated differently? You know, we kind of start to feed this grievance. So my argument to him was, first of all, understand faith. Understand the difference between, you know, this what personal faith means to somebody. Understand the difference between religious teachings, which people fundamentally feel are sacred to them, and actually the rule of law, and what law may say in Britain at any one point. Understand journeys. And I think for people of faith, and, you know, I consider myself a person of faith, they get that, and the nuances that make that up. But government... I'm not convinced always get that, gets that. And it's probably one of the reasons when I was Minister for Faith in government, I was often called the Minister for Fairies, Goblins, and Imaginary Friends. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Yes, sir. Um, this is a, a two-part question. Um, speaking as a lawyer and speaking as a Muslim lawyer, uh, and you mentioned Osama bin Laden there. Do you believe that Osama bin Laden got his comeuppance? Um, or do you believe that due process should have applied and that he should have been captured and tried in a court of law? And if you do believe that he got his comeuppance, do you think we are right to assassinate people from the air, such as Jih Jihadi John, uh, along with the collateral damage that goes with that? I mean, it's a, it's a terrific question. Uh, and it's, it's that question which kind of plays between, you know, the lawyer in you and the person of faith. I mean, for me, you know, I, I believe all life is sacred. And, and I start from that premise. And I believe that ultimately, you know, that, that's the way. And there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of God in everybody. There's a, there's a godliness in everybody. But I feel that what happened there with Osama bin Laden was inevitable. Look, we ended up with seals going into a house when they knew he was there he was invariably going to be there were if he, he wasn't going to come easily and if therefore there was a struggle and he was shot in that that's the way he went um i think that in many ways we we'd created this whole kind of myth around who osama bin laden was and we kind of felt well as long as we killed him we'd kill the problem i think get him him no longer on this earth and him dead is good for all of us but I think that for me, what's more important is actually dealing with the challenges. Uh, you know, somebody said to me, uh, you know, we killed the, the head of Al-Qaeda four times. And you can't just kill the head of something and hope it'll go away. It doesn't go away. Uh, look, look as, as somebody who was in the Foreign Office, we use diplomacy as the first tool and as the second tool and as the third. You know, Jeremy Corbyn said, we need a minister for peace. Well, for me, every minister in the Foreign Office should be a minister for peace. We should be using diplomacy at all stages. But there comes a point when diplomacy fails. And at that point, we have to go to war. You know, my grandfathers went to war. We have to go to war at times because we fight, we have to fight evil. And I have a child who will go to war at some point for Britain. 
And I think we have to accept that not everything can be done with diplomacy. And if that means that, you know, we have to go out and kill people who are out to kill us, then that's part of the real world we live in. Do you think we're at war with terrorists then? Is that the phrase you would use? Um, we are at war in terms of a battle of ideas, but it depends on who we is. You know, in, in the book, I spend time talking about us, the Muslims, and then them, the Muslims, and us, the government, and them, the government. You know, I am us and I am them. And this battle with terrorism, you know, uh, uh, two examples. Terrorism is a much bigger threat to my faith than it is to me as an individual. I mean, it is poisoning my faith. It is poisoning people of my faith. And therefore, terrorism is, is I'm at war with terrorism because of the way that it's, 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 it's poisoning, uh, it's poisoning you know, future generations uh, in the communities that I come from. But I also think that if we, I mean, it, it's a, this is a really personal example, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating. We have this concept that the terrorists are out to get us, and we define us as kind of white liberal Britain. And yet, interestingly, you know, when ISIS published its kill list last year of Brits that they wanted to target and asked people to target if they couldn't get to Syria. You know, of the very small list, four of us on there, the, the overwhelming majority of people on that list were British Muslims, and I was one of them. And therefore, I questioned this premise of who is it that us that they're coming after? And, and I think when we start to make counterterrorism policy, which is about bad people who want to kill, and they want to kill anybody who doesn't think like them, as opposed to we're at war with the Muslims or difference or whatever we happen to say, I think we're more likely to be able to start to fix the problem. Yes, to the back. Okay, my question is about integration. Ooh, there's a microphone. My question is about integration. Um, so my, my father and all of his family are from Pakistan, came over here, that's kind of our background, but um, my grandma was like committed Muslim and... Um, I think my dad, though, kind of came over and thought, actually, if I'm going to make it here, I have to become English. <laughs> and um, he always says that when he was growing up, it was um, his Pakistani family always viewed the English as, you know, that's where you want to be, that's what you want to be like. Um, what, what does it look like? Whereas my nan, I only remember her having lots of other Muslim friends. And um, what does integration look like? What does it look like when... Are we asking basically Muslims to just become white? No. Um, so. No, I mean, look, uh, what I say in the book is integration is a middle class pastime. Um, you know, integration is easy for, for me and for you. I mean, we probably have kids that go to the same schools. We, we probably ski in the same resorts all night. <laughs> <maybe>. um, <laughs> we probably go to the same resort in Spain, right? So we, we, it's easy to integrate when you live in a nice part of town and you have friends from lots of different backgrounds. But actually, integration is one of those privileges you get when you have a choice. But if you're in this place where you, you don't have a choice about where you live, that's the house you're given, it's the house you can afford. If you go to a school where you have no choice about the school that you go to, and that's, that's what you're given, I'm not sure integration is top of your kind of priority list. So you're surviving most of the time, and you're struggling, and you're just getting on with trying to get your kids into a decent school and get them into a job. And so I just think this nonsense about, oh, well, certain communities won't integrate. Yes, there are a very small number of individuals in, in a number of communities in this country who live separate lives. We have separatist communities in this life. We have, you know, the Plymouth Brethren. We have Hasidic, you know, we have Orthodox Jewry. We have, you know, very conservative members of the British Muslim community. They want to live their separatist little lives, but they're very, very small. Most people, when they're polled, like to live in mixed communities. But most people don't always have the choice. So what does, what does that integration look like? Well, that integration looks like giving everybody the opportunity to have a good life. That's what, for me, integration looks like. You can't... Uh, uh, people's identities change all the time. I mean, I have so many identities. I'm British. I'm Pakistani origin. I'm Muslim. I'm a, I'm a woman. You know, I'm a mother. I'm a conservative. I'm overwhelmingly Yorkshire. How do you even start to define, divide out those identities? 
Um, and I think for me, ultimately, it boils down to one, giving everybody an opportunity to have the best opportunities to be able to take advantage of integration. But secondly, a kind of a, a tolerance as a baseline. Acceptance would be great, but tolerance is, I might not like what you kind of believe in, but if fundamentally British values is about tolerating difference, then being able to do that, and, and, and I don't just say, say that from the majority community towards the minority community, there are incredibly intolerant elements within minority communities. And I think therefore, that's the space that we need to get into, a non-judgmental phase. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether, given your experience, which is unusual by any standards, of being a minister and presiding over relations between the faiths and so on, um, it seems to you that there's a difficult problem in a country like England, which on the whole is really a secularist sort of country. And the claim, I think, that some secularists, I can't say they're in good faith, obviously, because they're secularists, but who are well-meaning, um, that they are the best people to preside over this harmonious encounter of the different religions and so on, mm. is in itself a serious problem because anybody of any faith is bound to see some stiff who's there, who's a secularist without a, a thought of any depth in his head, I might think. How on earth is he going to make the peace and bound and establish a real dialogue Mm. among all these different people. Mm. Mm. Does it seem to you to be a problem? Mm. Uh, you, raise a re you raise a really, really important question, um, and there are two parts to that. So uh, one of the parts that I talk about is what does religiosity look like in Britain? And I track you know, which faiths are growing, which faiths are shrinking, which parts of, the, for example, the Christian faith is growing, which is shrinking, and, and, and I think we need to have an accurate picture of that. Secondly, and in, and in drawing up that accurate picture, also uh, drawing a distinction between those people who say they're religious but actually don't attend church, those people who uh, attend church and are part of a, a collective worship, those people who say they're religious but actually don't believe in any of the tenets of their faith, and that's, you know, so I, I think there are real kind of different ways in how you define what faith means and religiosity means because there are people who don't go to church who don't believe that there was a virgin birth who don't believe that Christ was the son of God but still say they're Christians because they, they fundamentally define themselves as Christians don't live their life according to what would be perceived to be Christian teachings and it's the same in other faiths as well so I think one and I unpick that in this what does religiosity look like today in Britain and there have been some fantastic work that's been done by um, um, uh, Baroness Butler Sloss and others in, in looking at that the commission of uh, the commission on faith in public life. Uh, the second part of it is, what's the space for faith in the public sphere? And it's the argument that I made in in government. And there is a view that if we all didn't have a faith and we all kind of be didn't believe in anything or believed in you know very little, we'd all get on. And I remember I I, I led one of the largest delegations that we've ever had to the Vatican. And I spoke, I had the privilege of speaking at the Ecclesiastical Academy there. And the argument that I made there was that if you believe that, you know, as a minority faith within, within Europe, which has a majority Christian uh, faith and a Christian heritage, I don't want you to dumb down your Christianity for me to feel like I can belong. And ultimately, I mean, the way I described it was I said, my Islam is like a river. It takes the color of the bed over which it flows. My Islam will not look colorful if the bed over which it flows doesn't know what it stands for anymore and doesn't know where its heritage comes from and actually strong open vibrant identities are more likely to be able to kind of find that space of reconciling rather than having no identity most often we find young men who are driven into extremism are, are driven into extremism because they don't actually have any sort of solid identity and are looking for identity and 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 and, and belonging um, and I remember when I did that speech, you know, it, because it was in English and uh, it was being translated into Latin and Italian and all sorts of things because the cardinals were all there. I could see them kind of adjusting their ear set, thinking, is she asking us to be more Christian? Yeah. <laughs> is she a closet Catholic? Um, and so, and I, and I think the reason I made that argument was because I fundamentally do believe that having an open faith and, and people of faith explaining what faith means to them I think we'll create part of the understanding. I hope you'll bear with me, actually, because it, it, I, I want to read out a section in here because there's a, 
There's a moment in the book where I actually uh, talk about my faith. Uh, I felt there was a bit where I needed to kind of lay my soul bare. Um, and I always wanted to, to work in theater. And my mom said, no, you're doing law. And, um, and so I'd spent a lot of time kind of, you know, I love the theater, love reading. And, and when I was writing this book and feeling very clever, I thought, this, is my, this was my soliloquy. This was the moment when I came out on the stage, the lights were down, the spotlight was on me. I was the only person and I was going to bear my soul to the audience. So I'm bearing my soul to you. You can't turn the lights off, but imagine we're on the theater. And I talk about the... the, the I talk about religion and when I was growing up, what that meant. And I talk about the stories that my father used to tell uh, uh, to us about religion. So we learned about the what of religion in the madrasa, but we learned the why of religion from my dad. And I say, it's the why that has been the largest influence on my personal belief. I am a Muslim. I would describe myself as a pragmatic practitioner. I'm not content with simply doing religion. There has to be a why. For me, reason and religion go hand in hand. The lawyer in me needs to see the evidence, and the politician in me needs to hear the argument. And it's why belief for me is not a stagnant position. It's a journey, not a destination. Evolutionary, not revolutionary. And ultimately, a source for daily reflection, self-evaluation at times of great success, and a source of strength at times of distress. My faith is about who I am, not about who you are. It's a rule book for me, not a false lecture series for you. Its strength is a source of peace for me, not ammunition with which to fight you. It's a ruler I have chosen to measure myself against, not a stick with which to beat you. It allows me to question myself, not to judge you. And recognizing myself, being sure of who I am, being comfortable in my identity, does not mean having to downgrade, erase, or reject who you are. I can only truly accept you for who you are, if I am truly sure of who I am. Um, so I'll be honest, I've been looking forward to having the opportunity to sort of speak with you and ask you a question for over a month now. Um, and part of that's because we do differ quite drastically on a lot of political issues. Um, first of all, I like the title of your book generally because I think it can be taken in many different ways. Um, and when I first was thinking of which question to ask you, I initially thought maybe I'd debate some of the conservative issues versus some of the more liberal issues. Um, and you obviously don't want to go into that, so I won't. Um, however, um, The Enemy Within strikes me as an interesting title because you clearly have some very, uh, very liberal ideas. You believe in inclusivity, you believe in integration, and so on. And the passage you just read there, I, I really resonate with. I think that's excellent. Um, and I'm a non-religious person, but I very much have lots of friends who are and they feel in a similar way to you, that, you know, live and let live, in essence, is what you're saying, which is great. Um, so my question really is this. It's um, how do you deal with having something like the media at the moment, particularly, which is increasingly more right-wing, which is driving people towards making decisions which are largely based on lies about immigration or at least misleading and spinning facts to do with immigration, particularly towards the Muslim community, um, more than any others. Um, how do you deal with that from a political standpoint, particularly when some of those same publications support um, political parties like yourselves? And I'll give you a small anecdote for that as well. My grandparents, who historically were always Labour voters, both voted Leave in the referendum. And that did surprise me because the reason they gave, and I'm slightly embarrassed as an ex-geography teacher for this, but the reason they gave um, was because my white grandmother and my Afro-Caribbean granddad decided to tell me that they wanted to stop the Muslim from Pakistan getting into Britain. I asked them where they thought Pakistan was, and they were adamant that it was in Europe. So you see the problems we're working with, and I think that perhaps when, uh, when you have misleading things in the media, that's obviously a somewhat extreme and maybe amusing anecdote, um, but you can see where I'm getting at. Um, how do you try and deal with that from a political perspective, particularly when everyone does have, rightfully so, a broad range of opinions, which is great, but when some of those opinions are misinformed intentionally and mis people are misled, but then make decisions and vote according to those lies. Mm -hmm. um, God, how do we deal the, with the thing known as the media? Um, and, and, and actually, we've just today announced, sadly, that we're not going to have Leveson too, which I think is tragic, actually. We've put it into the Conservative Manifesto. Um, and I, I genuinely do think we need to have a properly regulated press. Um, and we need to have checks and balances. So if they do write things which turn out to be true, then they put 
stories in which are just as big saying the truth. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's part of what we live with, unfortunately, is the, is the environment. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of change that comes in terms of the space in the media. Look, the, the good old days where you provided, you produced the content and the content paid for the distribution, which was what a newspaper was, has gone. Over time, distribution is now completely separated from content, and distribution is done in a way which it doesn't have to be paid for in the same way. So distribution could be the phone that you buy, and therefore the company that you're with, your internet provider, is the one that provides you with the distribution, and therefore it doesn't cost you anything because you're paying for your phone and your internet anyway. And so as this break comes between content and distribution, I think there's going to be a completely new space which government has to look at as to how we regulate. And, and I think there's some interesting things in the manifesto today about that kind of digital space and and i think where you know politicians are just so far behind what's really happening in terms of that so i think there will come a time when we will be able to keep up with this as to how how we actually regulate genuine news um uh, in terms of um in terms of the kind of internet space i, I think you, you, there's a broader question that you ask in in, in in that how do we deal with this kind of you know, what did people vote for on Brexit? I don't think your grandparents are unusual. The day after Brexit, there was a, a, a Channel 4 interview that was done in um, a town that I know well, Barnsley. Um, they, um, they asked a young guy, uh, uh, and, you know, perfectly reasonable looking bloke, why did you vote for Brexit? Uh, and he says, it's got nothing to do with anything else, it's just the Muslims, I want them out. And, um, and I just remember thinking, God, this poor man, you know, he's voted for something which makes him feel better, and he's never going to get it. And therefore, he's going to be so much unhappier at the end of all of this, more unhappy than he actually is. Um, and, and you know, he, you know, he was kind of talking about himself as a patriot and how, you know, he loved his country. And I just thought, you know, there's all these wonderful kind of patriots out there who don't actually love the country. They actually despise the country that they're in, and that's why they want to change it. And they can never change it to what they think they can change it to, which is what this great vision of 1950s Britain... Well, you know, what was 1950s Britain? Women didn't have many rights. If you joined the civil service, you had to leave. The LGBT, LGBT community was hounded. You know, blacks, Irish, and dogs didn't get tenancies. And, you know, I mean, what kind of Britain are we going to go back to? So I think this, we, we need, politicians need to be brave enough to, to get back out of the front foot and stop responding to the politics of rage, which is what we keep doing. And, you know, maybe, you know, and again, this is not party political, maybe a, a kind of a strong government will be able to kind of say a strong and stable government. I got it out. <laughs> you know, maybe kind of a, a, a strong government can start to say we don't have to respond to political kind of knee-jerk reactions. As a Muslim, obviously, it's very personal. There's a whole chapter in this called The Seven Sins of Islamophobia. And um, what I talk about is that I, I, don't have a, people, I don't have a problem with people saying I don't like Muslims. Fine, you know, I had grew up with people saying I don't like Pakistanis, I don't like Asians. What I find really difficult to deal with, and I saw this in policy making, is when the respectable rationalize racism. So this chapter is all about, oh, it's not that I don't like Muslims, it's just that. And then there's some BS excuse about why they don't. And it's rationalized in all sorts of academia. And so I think one of the things we have to do is be prepared to push back against what I think is respectable racism where people feel it's okay to, um, and, and do it in kind of intellectual forms. The number of times I turn on the television and you have out and out Islamophobes on mainstream news channels talking about things as if they're kind of respectable and acceptable. I mean, we're having the, you know, we have White House, White House staff now who are considered to be beyond the pale, crazy people who we kept on the fringes, who are now apparently, well, they're not running the US, but are in charge of it. So, you know, I kind of, I, I, I kind of think that we are in a, in a difficult place. From a personal perspective as a Muslim, I still think there's some good in this, you know. And I say that, you know, I, I kind of make a virtue of this because from a community perspective, I've spent many, many years looking at British Muslim communities thinking, it's not business as usual, guys. You know, you don't have the luxury of just sitting this one out. You know, if we just go, if we just kind of bury our heads for heads for a while, it'll go away. And we now have a, a young generation which is coming through, which is raising its game, which is actually saying, "I need to be an absolute member of everything that's around me. I am going to challenge within as well as out. 
I'm actually going to, you know, it's really kind of bringing a vibrancy. And the Muslim comedy scene is brilliant. I mean, you know, this, this climate has created a fantastic series of comics across the world. So I genuinely think that there will be some good that will come out of this in the end, because I, I, I genuinely will look back, hopefully, in 20 years' time when we've been through this period, with a, which, with a stronger, more confident community, which is playing a much bigger role in, in Britain. The media is one thing. What about fake news? How dangerous do you think fake news is? Because you can't control it, can you? I suppose, the, I mean, Facebook are developing some kind of um, ways in which you can now. This and, and and I think the internet providers and, and social network providers are going to have to step up and say, you know, we there are ways in which they can control some aspects of, of what comes out. But ultimately, look, fake news can only be delivered if you're daft enough to believe it. You know, I, I, I don't think, you can't control the content, but you can educate the masses. You can say, I, I always say to, I, you know, I always say this to a lot of British Muslim parents who kind of think, oh, if we just keep our kids closeted over here. So there are a very small number of British Muslim communities in this country, really small, who believe that you shouldn't have access to television and all the kind of other things. And, and there was a guy I met and he said, oh, you know, we have a very Islamic home, we don't have a television. And I thought, should I tell him that his kids are probably watching porn on their mobile? You know, <laughs> and probably not a good moment to let him know that. And I just, and so what I kind of say is, look, you can't control what they have access to, but you can give them the skill set to rationalize it out and work out which bits they should take part in and what bits they shouldn't. And I think it's that difference of, you know, do we trust our young to be savvy enough to be able to deal with this, the coming generations, or do we actually think, no, no the only way to deal with it is nanny state and stop giving them access to anything? One final question. Uh, yes. Hi, um, I'm Malaysian. And um, uh, Malaysia is in a situation where there's an increasing Islamic, uh, Islamist rhetoric and women are being persecuted, uh, non-religious people are being persecuted. I was just wondering what you thought uh, in, in terms of what the role was for British missions abroad in promoting British values mm -hmm. and what the role is for British foreign aid to prevent um, this extremist um, uh, values abroad. Okay. I mean, Malaysia is a, f a really interesting example because I, as actually, as when I was minister at the Foreign Office, uh, I visited Malaysia a number of times, including I, uh, with the Global Moderates Movement, which was something that came out of Malaysia as a way of, actually, they, they were saying they were going to try and tell us and others about how we needed to have a moderate movement. And I g became increasingly concerned about some of the stories that came out, including, for example, they had a you know, huge issue about the use of the word Allah in, in Bibles, which had been used for decades and, in fact, centuries. And, and so there was a closing in. And part of that, I think, is politically driven. Uh, it's about, you know, creating, you know, it's about who's the alpha community in Malaysia and using religion as a way of reinforcing that because of the diversity that there is in Malaysia. But I think if I take your question to, away from Malaysia into a broader uh, space, I actually believe that every every country will find their own version of their practice of their faith. Uh, Malaysian Islam is very different to, say, Pakistani Islam, which is very different to Saudi Islam, which is very different to North African Islam. And what I'm quite acutely aware of is that there are, you know, we can't tell you how your country and how Malaysia should be finding its way through its religious pluralism, just like I wouldn't want, you know, Malaysia to be coming here and telling British Muslims or British communities what your values are and how we impose them here. I think it's for communities within those nations to find their own very unique sense of Islam. So if I give you an example, you know, France and, France and, and Britain, British Islam is so different to French Islam. Why? Because actually, France is so different to Britain. France and religion is an interesting relationship, completely different to Britain and religion. And therefore, we ca I don't think there are these solutions that you can impose. And in the past, there has been a sense that you can. And I think, you know, certainly it was, you know, George W. Bush time and Tony Blair time, they felt they could go around and kind of have these versions and of, of, of what it meant to be British, you know, what it means to be our values and British values and British Islam. In fact, we used to send out delegations of people that used to go to these places and talk about British Islam. Uh, I think it, it, it's going to be a, a space that you guys work out, just like fundamentally here in this country, we have to find a very unique sense of what it means to be British and Muslim. Um, that journey has already started here. 
Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the month of fasting is around the corner. It's a couple of weeks away. Um, and in the past, you know, when, when fasting happened, everybody kind of closed in and, you know, you kind of stayed within your own communities. You even took time off work. Occasionally you take food to the neighbors and that was the extent of it. Now, Ramadan starts and all the young are out. And Ramadan is a month to say, right, I need to live out my faith. How do I do that? I'm going down to the soup kitchen. I'm helping out at the food bank. I'm going to work at the homeless shelter. I'm going to be running, uh, putting out big iftars in the park, a Ramadan tent, you know, dine at mine is a, a new one which is like come dine at me but you come and have a meal at a Muslim home very late at night fantastic meals if you want if you're interested in getting involved <laughs> you know the big iftar where people are opening up their homes and mosques and everything and saying come and share food with me so there is and that's a very kind of unique sense of British Islam which is now developing and I'm confident that you know other countries like Malaysia will find their own accommodation with all the communities that make them up I'm sure we could talk for another hour without any problem at all. Uh, what a fantastic way of helping to celebrate 50 years of Leeds Trinity to hear such optimism, such positive food for thought. Thank you very much. Thank you.